This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in In the the next next normal. normal. Taylor, president of Challenge Factory. The reason every decision we go to make is so difficult is because it's laden with moral hazard. We can't actually judge what's good and bad. Dave Hardy, president of Hardy Stevenson and Associates. COVID has really pushed us to think about what healthy cities mean. Sarah Thorne, president and CEO at Decision Partners. We've really acknowledged the recognition and the safety and the caring for each other because we've adopted these new behaviors. Ujwal R. Colgood, Chief Anthropologist and CEO at MotiveBase. And this is not just because of the pandemic, this is because a lot of us have gained new knowledge. Welcome back. I'm Erin Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford. And we are full force into the next normal here. And episode four, I think it's important for us to talk about dare I say it's a bit of a buzzword or it's becoming a buzzword, the concept of resilience and how Mm -hmm. I think really this is a fair thing to say that it's a bit of a moving target. We don't really know what it means anymore. Well, that's clear. And I think going into this, it's one of those things that we thought affected others, right? We thought, you know, if you were resilient, it's because you faced some serious challenges, a physical disability, or you had mental illness, uh, you know, and we didn't talk about mental wellness. And resilience is muscle building. Resilience isn't about making things easy to deal with. It means that that you are equipped to cope with them. And it doesn't mean it's not going to be difficult, but you're better equipped to deal with what's on the horizon. And I think what we've learned too, is that resilience is not necessarily a learned skill in and of itself, but it like, to your point, it's a practice of being able to make decisions Uh, in the short term that impact the long term. And so that's kind of where we start today's show is with that conversation around what is it to be resilient and how do we make more resilient decisions? And Sarah Thorne is going to kick us off today with this conversation. Um, And it's it's a good one. Well, and it's also one of the other phrases I just want to throw in before we get to Sarah. We we pivot on Mm. the phrase pivot Mm -hmm. because Sarah starts talking about how we have adapted. And that's a better phrase than pivot. I think it's really important to start our conversation today by really setting the context and talking about adaptive capacity and then move on and talk about resilience. And I think that if we talk about these in the context of decision making and behavior, which is really the area that I focus on, it'll set us up for our future discussions, including when we talk about policy implications and opportunities going forward. So just to sort of set the table a little bit, in the Engineering with Nature podcast that I host and Dave produces for the Army Corps of Engineers, in our sixth episode of season two, which we did uh, about a month ago, we were talking with Safra Altman of the Army Corps and Marshall Shepard, who's a meteorologist with the University of Georgia about climate change, extreme weather, and community adaptation and resilience. And it will be of no surprise to anybody that poorest communities and the most vulnerable people are the ones that experience the greatest impacts of climate change and they're least able to adapt and consequently they're the least resilient to current and future impacts. So we're seeing exactly the same thing in the pandemic. Um, Our most vulnerable vulnerable people are the ones that are at greatest risk of exposure. They've suffered the greatest consequences. And to your point, Dave, we should have been prepared for that. We should have known that. And I, I think about the vulnerable seniors, the vulnerable personal support care workers in the long-term care homes, for example, that really, um, really suffered. And we lost so many people before we had the vaccines. And, and then I'm thinking about people that are living in the hotspot areas still, often low-income areas, often multi-generational homes, often with family members who are going in and out, trying to make a living doing two or three part-time jobs. So these folks are high risk, high exposure, also high vulnerability. So I think it would be interesting to talk today about what have we learned so far about our own adaptive capacity, 
that of our families and people we have relationships with, and then talk about what are we learning about adaptive capacity in our communities and in society. And then once we've had a bit of a conversation about that, we can think about resilience. What can and should we do with what we're learning to make our families and our communities and, and our society more adaptive and ultimately more resilient? You know, as, as Sarah's talking here, and I, all I can think of is that we, we've talked about not being ready for it, uh, the, i.e. we didn't have a plan in place. We have our resident planner on, as a host here on the show, Dave Hardy, is uh, with Hardy Stevenson and, and also is the executive director of the Institute for New Suburbanism. And I wonder how all of this sort of makes you grind your teeth, Dave, as, as we look in the rearview mirror and that we could have been better prepared for it and, you know, adapting would have been easier. Yes, uh, th thanks, Dave. Uh, my, my teeth are ground uh, fairly low right now. Um, <laughs> um, we do have emergency plans, and, uh, and and we do plan for pandemic. Most institutions do that, but we were really tested. And I thought what we're seeing is, is we're actually we're really missing the fundamentals, and we continue to do so. Uh, I looked at the. Uh, you know, the ice storm uh, back in 2013 and, and the huge power outage in 2005, we still haven't um, learned our lessons from that in terms of uh, making sure we are stronger and resilient, even though we, we certainly have been able to adapt. To Sarah's point, though, you know, in, in terms of a plan, the, if you're wealthy, if you're living in the core of cities, you, you have no problem. You actually did better during the pandemic. It's those pockets in the suburbs that have really been struggling. Uh, I talked to a, a federal politician. I said, "There's no; these people have no internet and the, their businesses, employers have no internet and they can, Canada's largest city, no internet. I couldn't believe it, but it's, it's the case. We have food security issues that we should be well on top of. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I Going local, local food is fine, except when there's a power outage or it's the middle of winter. You just don't get your food through kind of those sustainability initiatives. And of course, our health care was overwhelmed, um, uh, in particular our frontline workers. And we just don't learn those lessons. As a planner, um, we do plans, but it, we need to do an awful lot of thinking. I just don't see it going on, and it needs to. Probably the one area where we were most uh, adaptive and resilient was in, in was in the workplace, Lisa. It's where we, you know, everybody we overuse the word pivot, but but we're all doing work now remotely as if it's normal. Yeah, so I think that we have seen uh, all kinds of examples of resilience, but I really want to take it down to some of the things that have happened that are the kind of the markers of how we actually have adapted and. One of the things that has struck me right from March 2020 all the way through is how focused everyone is on what the date is going to be for when they can move to the next step mm -hmm. or the next stage and how little planning has been done so that when we individually, organizationally, sector-wide, when we actually hit the date, we knew what to do next. So right from the very beginning of the pandemic, the headlines and the, to, the conversation has always been, is it going to be this date or that date? Or it's shifting you know, by one day or another? Or they said it was going to be August this, and now it's November this. The, the date and the actual time is actually irrelevant if we don't know what we want to do on that date. And so I think as we realize and think through what's the difference between being in the midst of a crisis and what's the difference between returning to a world of work that was already changing, precarious employment was already a topic, massive demographic change, already a topic. At Challenge Factory, we call that the talent revolution, and it has a 20-year horizon. You know, what's what's the difference and how do we continue adapt to adapt when the official date of the end of the crisis passes, but we're still in revolutionary times? Uh, how do we continue to adapt and evolve in those circumstances? 
Yeah, Uj, while we were talking uh, recently and, uh, you know, the whole idea of trying to figure out what to do next can't be looking in the rear view mirror. Um, mm-hmm. And you and your team are the ones that are sort of looking well down the road. What's the horizon look like? Yeah, I think the big, big change that we've seen is the meanings around resiliency have begun to change to include a conversation about equity thanks to the pandemic. Uh, interestingly enough, when you looked at the topic of resiliency, a lot of the meanings revolved around dealing with personal challenges, personal challenges in my life. Now, thanks to the pandemic, there's a greater recognition of the fact that the world is much broader than my own life, my own local community, you know, what's going on in uh, within the household. And there is an increased recognition of the fact that there's an equity problem in how resilient we can be as people and in the expectations that we tend to impose on other people without realizing that you know their experiences, their background, uh, their own infrastructure may prevent them from actually you know, being uh, resilient, uh, from actually adapting uh, the way you know, one might be able to. I think that um, I want to pick up on what Lisa and Ujwal have both said. I think, first of all, Lisa, your point about the dates is so critical because the dates, frankly, have been irrelevant. What's really important is that we understand what the factors are that let us move to the next stage. And the communications about those has been um, uh, a little challenging, shall we say. Um, but we need to understand that there are a whole bunch of factors. <laughs> Abysmal, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't say that, but Dave, perhaps I'm agreeing with you. But there are all these different factors. And in fact, what we need to do if we want people to be adaptive, which we do and which they have been and which they will continue to be, they need to understand all these different factors. And picking up on your point, Ujwal, I think it's real. one of the factors that's really important that has come to the forefront and perhaps it's been a surprise for some people is just how vulnerable some of the uh, members of our communities really are. I think that the pandemic has really shone a light on that and perhaps it's something that we're a lot more conscious of now and hopefully more reflective and hopefully when we think about our communities and being more resilient, we're being more holistic in our thinking and including, you know, the whole community, not just, you know, the neighborhood that we live in, in our thinking going forward. So let me just drop this stink bomb into the middle of the conversation. And and, and to that point then, Sarah, if we have more awareness is one thing, but I think that there's a double-edged nature to this. On the one hand, we can all be more aware of it and empathetic. It may even call us to action. On the other side, we realize the depth of the problem, and I feel like I'm incapable of doing anything about it. So I, whether I'm willfully ignorant or not, I find myself really kind of handcuffed and not able to respond to it. And that only deepens the problem that we're already facing. I think we saw that, Dave, in spades with the outrage that started to happen when the realization happened that there wasn't paid sick days or ways for these vulnerable workers to be able to take time off to go get vaccinated and to recover from the vaccination. And the outcry that happened over the days and weeks leading up to the modified policy that started to come in was outrageous. I mean, it was really at such a high level, never before had we really seen such focus on what it means to be in a precarious employment situation and what the real implications are, not just to those workers, but to everyone and why this is an issue that everyone needs to get behind. And yet, a week after that happened, there's no discussion anymore about the conditions. Nobody really has followed up to see 
does it actually, did it actually help? What, what are the conditions now? Are people accessing it? What have been the implications for those that have? Is this a permanent solution? Has it actually solved the problem? Or in the moment, did it just make us feel good? So I think there's lots of examples where we have had a bit of a reckoning and a recognition that there is action all of us needs to do in order to help everyone become more resilient and more successful within the structures that we have in our society. But will it be sustained? And I think that's the actual definition of our true resilience. Do we have the resilience to stick at the problems even after the immediate emergency crisis seems to have passed? I um, <clears throat> fully agree with you, Lisa. In fact, I'm almost seeing as the, the next uh, opening date, people are seeing it as that is a date we can put things behind us. And that should actually be the date that we start to say, what have we learned? Um, it, it needs um, <clears throat> all of us, uh, governments, private and so on, to, first of all, I, I'm a big fan of engagement of people, but, but ask them, how did this affect you? Uh, what do we need to do to improve? How can we strengthen? I think that would uh, be a necessary and important focus of government and, and private corporations in terms of how to, to build the better future. I, I do get concerned about people who say build back better. Like to me, better is your ideology. I would like to see build back better based on what the groundswell of people are saying through engagement. And then we identify what better is. I think one common challenge uh, throughout this pandemic has been that we all tend to overestimate how much change it will actually bring about in human behavior. And as much as we look at the world through the lens of meaning, one of the things we find is even in cases where new meaning has developed and accelerated, like in the area of resiliency, people's understanding of what that is. Yes, there have been uh, there's new knowledge developing in the marketplace among uh, the average consumer, the average person. However, that change is still small and there is a gap between knowledge development and doing. And that gap takes sometimes years to fill. So I think, you know, I, I agree with you, Dave. I think this is a starting point of reflection, but we're still a few years away from really seeing tangible impact of this, if there is going to be one. We're all using the word resilience and we're using it as if it's something that we have all been blessed with. Uh, my sense of it is it has to be a learned and an acquired skill, if you want to call it that, or a muscle that we're developing, uh, and that it's not necessarily something that's going to make life simpler moving forward. It's going to prepare us better to respond to difficult times. But, you know, again, that's my own lens. Ujwal, where are we with that? Um it's it, it's a tough one because the the challenge is that on one hand we've seen that the pandemic has has made us a lot more numb to the plight of others we've certainly seen that uh and you know despite new knowledge developing about the challenges with equity about how you know different people have less resources than than most of us do in, in being able to take on the challenges that life presents to them. Despite that, we've also seen just as much of a rise in just a, a, a complete disregard for the experiences and the challenges that uh, other people, especially people uh, in lower income communities, marginalized communities, uh, racialized communities have experienced. Uh, and unfortunately, the two are going uh, hand in hand, and that, that's not uncommon. We see that a lot where there's two streams that just go in, in parallel in the opposite direction, but they develop in parallel. I was going to say, I don't mind if some of these things are going to take a long time. I mean, society evolves over long periods of time. I think the thing that's the most helpful is to recognize that there's two different modes of responding to change. One is, and I'll use a healthcare analogy, one is acute. It's the emergency room treatment. It's, you know, something is happening and we need to have everything thrown at it and it's urgent and, the, you know, it's an existential crisis. The other is chronic care management, where it's still serious. It could still kill the patient if it's not taken care of, but it needs to be taken care of over decades. And we need the fortitude 
and the resilience and the systems and the specialists and the way to be able to access it so that we can solve the problem in a way that doesn't burn us out, that doesn't demand an enormous amount of resources that is impossible to sustain and actually leads to healthier and healthier outcomes over time. Um, and I think part of the shift that we need to see is how can even just individuals in their own life shift from feeling like they're in the middle of the crisis where there's an emergency room situation about to happen any second to taking what they've learned to Dave's point and incorporating it into, and how do I want to start to shift the way that I think about the meaning of things as Ujwal has been introducing over a long period of time. Let's take the pressure off to say we have to solve every problem by the end of this year or we've failed. Or to Dave's point when we first started, if we can't solve it by the end of this year, let's throw our hands up and say it's too hard and back away from the problem. Let's, let's give people the way to have a longer time horizon. And I think that that's why we need to think carefully about the language that we use. And we need to think carefully about putting out dates. Like we get, when we check the box, um, we can say that we're done. We are in a situation where adaptive management is required and it's gonna be required for as long as we can possibly imagine. And if we got people thinking and using that kind of language about what, and to your point, Ujwal, what have we learned so far in this pandemic? What are we expecting to learn in the months coming up? Where are we going over the long term? And what, have, what do we need to do? And what do we need to stop doing? Um, and I think that would be a much more um, useful and creative conversation that would actually lead us to more resilient, sus sustainable solutions than looking at it like, um, you know, we've, we've won the race, we can check the box and um, move on. All the language around the pandemic has been, you know, like we're trying to win the race. We're trying to win, you know, win the battle. It's not a battle. It's going to be an ongoing event. All right, so we got a better understanding of what resilience is, and we heard Ujwal, our Kalgood, our cultural anthropologist on that today. We got a better understanding of what pivot means because Lisa Taylor, so brilliant at kind of pinpointing some of this stuff for us, and Sarah got into this whole idea of the adaptive response and not only how it affects what we did in our personal lives, but our relationships and so on. And, you know, again, Dave Hardy kind of taking us back into history where we should have learned from experiences like the um, blackout back in 2003, SARS 2003. We had all of this in front of us. So here's hoping <laughs> that the next normals become a point where these are opportunities of learning. And that's where the resilience is really going to come from. We started talking about this, and it really is, I think what you were saying, is awareness. And I think it's also this understanding and awareness that resilience is again, it's not just one thing, it's a layered approach. So when we look at it through the lens that Dave brought to us with, you know, what did we learn from SARS? What did we learn from the blackout? What did we learn from the ice storm? Um, you know, and then layer that on top of what we have learned through the COVID pandemic, what we see too, and this was a big aha for me in this uh, episode, is that the next normal or pandemic recovery is you know, it's not a battle that is going to be fought and won with one particular event. It's not going to be, you know, getting to that vaccination percentage point. It's not going to be getting X number of workers back into the office. None of that is going to signify the end. This is a moving target. It's an event that we're now living and it's incredibly nuanced. And but at the, the heart of that really is this understanding of adaptability and resilience, which I think lends itself to the next conversation we should have, which is our well-being. Because how can we be resilient when, you know, the demographics um, mean that we have limited choices? You know, where we live impacts how we can make choices, how we can adapt, and how good our lives 
are. And I think that's really a big question that we need to start uncovering when we look at what the next normal is going to look like. And so just let me paraphrase what you said about an event. To be clear, we're not going to have a Death Star explosion at the end of this. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there. This is the next normal. The Next Normal is sponsored by Challenge Factory, shaping the future of work. By Decision Partners. Our world is a better place when we make better decisions. By Motive Base, decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about. And by Hardy Stevenson and Associates, planning the cities of the future. Comments, questions, or ideas for our hosts? Feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com. This series is produced for the Story Studio Network by Eye Contact Productions.